Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Green Mountain Care Board meeting. My name is Kevin Mullen, Chair of the Board, and we will start with the Executive Director's Report. Susan Barrett. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. Welcome, everybody. Just a brief announcement regarding scheduling. Next week, we have a board meeting on the calendar. Um, that's July 1st. At this point, we do not have any agenda items, and um, unless we um, receive a, a need for an agenda item next week, we will be canceling that board meeting. Um, and I want to wish everyone a happy 4th of July, which is next weekend. Um, so that is all. Oh, I do have one other announcement. Um, the July schedule, speaking of July 1st, our July schedule will be posted in the next couple of days. And just as a reminder, we're switching over to Teams, uh, our, another platform, and all of the information will be available on that press release and on our website. And that's all I have to report. Thank you, Susan. I'm going to call on you again in just a minute to uh, take the attendance for the public record. But before we do that, um, is there a motion on the minutes of uh, Wednesday, June 17th? So, so moved. I'll second that. It's been, been moved <laughs> by uh, Member uh, Pelham and seconded by Member Usifer. And um, is there any further discussion? If not, all those in favor signify it by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. I'm going to turn it back to you, Susan, for the attendance. Sure. Um, so I'm going to call out the last four numbers of your name. Of your. Let me start that again. I'm going to call out the last four numbers of your four numbers of your phone number. Please respond with your name so we know who's on the line from the public. Um, I'm going to start with 9997. Amy Bonet, one care. Hey, Amy. 5001. Julia Shaw with the Healthcare Advocate. Hi, Julia. 0476. Lisa Pierron from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont. I know. 2505. Jennifer Carlos, TV and Medical Center. Welcome. <clears throat> Seven four three eight. Ham Davis. Hi, Ham. Zero zero four three. Becky Lewandowski with ARM. Four one one zero. Kim Douglas, one care Vermont. One zero one zero four two. Robin Alvis in MC. Hi, Robin. Zero two two nine. Rick Dooley, help first. Great. Welcome. Seven one one one. Judy Fox from Rutland. Hey, Judy. Um, one nine seven zero is our office number. I have a um, three zero. I have two three zero zero zeros. Mm -hmm. I don't know who that is. Um, eight four seven three zero zero zero. That's uh, Tyler Gothier at One Care. Oh hi. Great. Um, because I'm calling in from work. It's Vicky. Okay, great. I'm glad you got back in, Vicky. Um, three four five two. Rebecca Copan, Blue Cross. Rebecca. Um, 2130, did I call this one? This looks like a Montpelier number. Might be a, an office number. 2130. Okay, and then we have Carmon, Carmen Austin. We have Katie Jickling, Lucy Ferrand, Orca Media. Dr. Wasserman, Sarah Teachout, Carol Stone, oh, I see Tyler again, um, and Spencer Weffler. Did I miss anyone? I think a couple of people might have added, but I think I got everyone. Walter at 4534. 
<laughs> okay, hi Walter. And did I hear Pat Jones? Yes, she did. Welcome, Pat. That. Thank you. Thank you. Susan, this is Kathy Fulton from VTQHC as well. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Kathy. I don't see any additional numbers at this point. I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Susan. At this time, uh, we're going to start uh, talking about um, One Care Vermont, and I'm going to uh, turn it over to Elena Baraby, um, Director of Payment Reform, to uh, um, lead us into this discussion. Hello. Welcome, everybody. I just wanted to say a couple things uh, before Vicki got started. Um, just, so just a reminder, this is the ACO's revised 2020 budget. Uh, it was previously scheduled in March, but we um, allowed uh, to postpone this date for the ACO to have some time to respond to COVID-19 and think about renegotiating their contracts and adjusting their budget accordingly. So I think you'll, you'll see some um, kind of significant changes over the budget that you saw. Um, so there are still some moving pieces, particularly around contracts that the ACA is working to finalize. I just wanted to point that out, that it's not uh, totally set in stone yet. Um, you know, we're going to be working on a staff analysis. We want to recreate a version, a simpler, speedier version of the fall, um, not 100 slides, but we still need to do kind of robust analysis and show you how the a budget is adjusting uh, versus what you approved. So in a couple of weeks, we'll kind of go through the budget order and show you what they delivered, um, which conditions are, are still met, which conditions may require adjustment, um, and then kind of go from there. Um, so, you know, this will look at things like the admin ratio, which you may have seen has decreased um, relative to where it was before. Um, so that is not concerning to us so far, but we'll look again at the uh, FPP percentages and how those may have changed given final attribution and some of the other payer contracts and then um, kind of, you know, round out the rest of the budget order condition. So just a preview uh, for what's to come. And um, we look forward to the conversation. I, Kevin, I think um, can can I just say I think folks need to um, to uh, mute their line. I'm I'm hearing a little feedback. I and feedback. I, okay, and I do see there's an additional number ending in seven nine zero two. If you could introduce yourself as well. Oh. Okay, that number went away. So, um, okay, I'll turn it back to you, Chair Mullen. I still hear the feedback. Might even be on your end, Susan. Okay, you're not hearing it? Oh, I hear it. No, 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 I I'm saying it. that it might be yours that you've got to mute. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I will say that um, I'm not sure that the Internet in Calus is the greatest because I, I notice we have a lot of problems whenever – Elena is speaking, so it, it could be a combination of factors, but I am hearing some pretty good feedback. So if everybody who's not speaking could go ahead and mute themselves, except for Vicki and Tom, that would be great. And Vicki, whenever you're ready. Oh, we're not hearing you, Vicki. Vicki Lohner, are you on this call? Is anybody hearing me? Yes, I hear you. Yeah. I'm, I'm hearing you, Mr. Chair. Thanks. Okay. Are there any slides that we should be seeing? I, somebody just gave me a prompt to hit star six because I had been muted. Okay. Can you hear me? We can now. <laughs> okay. All right. I was like, oh, come on. I cannot do another technology failure today. Okay. Are you so, your slideshow or is someone else? Yes, I will. I'm going to okay. present now. Thank you.
Can you see my slideshow? We can. We're beginning to worry that we lost you again. <laughs> no, just everything is moving in very slow motion today. So, uh, for the record, Vicki Lohner, CEO, One Care Vermont. I also have on the line with me Tom Boris, who's our Senior Director of ACO Finance and Payment Reform. We're going to tag team this a little bit. Um, if at any time we lose reception, please just raise a hand so I, I know to try to fix things on our end. So with that, I, I thought I'd frame the conversation that this pandemic has really um, provided us with a deep insight into all the flaws in our fee-for-service system currently and how it really has failed our healthcare system when we needed it to support us the most during this public health pandemic. Uh, it, as we all know, it supports volume, it supports um, things within your four walls, it really does not incentivize prevention, population health management. And I found it interesting, we added a last minute slide to this, that the head of CMS just came out in an issue brief um, calling to action the need to really accelerate what we are doing in our payment reform system right now. Um, that no more can we rely on the fee-for-service system and really need to make that transition. I believe that we have the opportunity under the all-payer ACO model to do just that, to really accelerate some of these payment um, reform initiatives that we have available to us so that we can provide some predictability and future resiliency to our healthcare system. Um, is everybody still hanging with me? I just lost people. Yes, we're, we're here, and okay. uh, we have your picture. What we're seeing is provider-led reform. Okay, awesome. Thank you. So oftentimes uh, I'm asked, do we need an ACO? What is an ACO? It seems complicated. Um, what's its value? And I thought this would be a really good opportunity for me to just address that um, with the board and, and the public really to just distill the value of an accountable care model and to bring us down a little bit of memory lane of when we made a decision as a state to enter this demonstration program with the Centers for Medicaid and Medicaid, Medicare Innovation was to use the ACO as the primary vehicle for wow. efforts. I think you all also recall that, you know, the ACO was really created as Medicare's prime vehicle for bringing forward uh, financial and clinical reform and accountability. And that is the main uh, vehicle by which CMMI and CMS is using really to drive a lot of the innovations. They, they too, believe that the fee-for-service system is not sustainable for the future. One of the be biggest benefits I see to this type of reform versus past um, efforts that we've made to try to really um, look around the edges of what we could do to change uh, the way healthcare is delivered is that this is more of an inside out reform where providers are really leading the effort. They're taking accountability both clinically and financially. And I think in Vermont, um, it's pretty exceptional the number of providers that have stepped forward to be a part of this coalition to really change the way that uh, healthcare is delivered and paid for. If you look to the quadrant on your left, at least it's on my left, under financial administration, this is one of the large benefits of an ACO in that it can negotiate fixed costs and budgets across payers for multiple uh, provider groups that are not part of the same organizational TIN. And that provides um, some opportunity and less volatility as to if people not having to go at it at their own organizational level. It also provides some fixed predictable payment for providers. And I think Tom will illustrate later on in the 
the presentation how valuable those fixed payment streams were during the months of March through the early part of June as revenues declined as services had to be shut down to be able to provide that steady stream. It also allows the ACO to be able to look at the way things are paid for a little bit differently, putting more of an incentive on value in those quality measures over time versus continuing to incentivize volume. <coughs> The other aspect is uh, population health, and this is um, really having some common set of metrics and standards that cut across um, the state of Vermont. It also really encourages investments in prevention and also looking at chronic illness. So it's really looking at both sick care and how, how do we help people stay well. This all leads, in my um, opinion to a better patient and patients are experiencing better outcomes, there's more uh, benefit flexibility, there's flexibilities in the waivers such as being able to go to a skilled nursing facility versus having to spend some time in a hospital prior to admission. They're receiving kind of standardized evidence-based care and from the provider's perspective Really, that reduction in administrative burden by having, you know, standard quality measures so you're not having, um, I, I guess I'll call it death by a thousand um, quality measures, although that still does exist and there's still some work to be done there. The last point on this slide that I'd like to make is this really is about integration and the system working together in a new and better way and being able to share both data resources, infrastructure, not having to duplicate, you know, 14 different, um, let's, let's hope it was 14 different electronic medical records. We know there's much more than that. Um, being able to work together in teams and breaking down a lot of those silos that exist under a current structure. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide because we talked about this last time I presented, but as I think about this, there's a lot of programmatic and policy actions that the ACO has taken um, as we have um, geared up for a potential surge and as we look to hopefully be in more of a recovery mode right now. Those fixed perspective payments have really been um, something that we want to accelerate, we want to drive. Um, further into the revenue streams. Right now, it's a small percentage of the overall revenues that hospitals and independent primary care have um, or are receiving in those fixed payments. Really looking at how we accelerated some cash flow to uh, both primary care, the continuum of care, such as home health and designated agencies, and the hospitals uh, during the pandemic so that they could have a good cash infusion, look to see how we could reconcile that later on. Uh, expanding and rolling out some fixed payments with Blue Cross Blue Shield in Bennington, Southwestern Medical Center area that um, is still ongoing and uh, operating relatively smoothly right now, and so we'd look to see if we could expand that into the future. We did a lot to take down a lot of the administrative requirements of documentation around uh, quality measures and reporting for those who were part of the program because we knew their time was best spent um, helping during the pandemic at this point in time. Building a lot of tools, I talked about the tools that we have developed internally to be able to help providers identify those individuals who are most vulnerable during the pandemic, either because of chronic conditions, frailty, um, being elderly, alone, uh, socioeconomic status, and making those care and concern calls out to uh, make sure that conditions don't escalate as they uh, stay home in place. I think where we are right now is still looking at how we re renegotiate those payer contracts. 
that's been a big part of our work. And as Alina um, noted earlier, we are still working on those negotiations. And I can talk to you a little bit um, about the path that we're taking and hope to have some resolution to those shortly. So, speaking of contract updates, these are programs as they currently exist in our payer contracts. We had the Medicare program, the Medicaid, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont for both the qualified health plans and the uh, large group and self-insured contracts. And of course, new to us this year is an MVP contract. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the MVP contract. That contract is in place. It's not undergoing any sort of changes at this time. It is a shared savings contract. So we decided to focus our resources and time on the Medicare, Medicaid, and Blue Cross Blue Shield contracts because they do provide um, both upside and downside risk for the ACO and its participants. The three main goals of this were to reduce overall risk to the providers who are participating, so looking at reducing some of those risk corridors for those programs, making sure that this year was a quality measurement action period only and that providers would not be penalized for any uh, reductions in some of the quality measures that really do have a heavy focus on prevention. We've done a really nice job of transitioning to telemedicine and telehealth, and that's taken some time to be able to do that. And we also know that there's still a certain part of the population uh, that is not uh, interacting with the healthcare system because of fear, and that uh, delaying care um, could result in some worse health outcomes for them. So it's really trying to get the message out to them as well. We are probably the closest to um, signing with Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont for their qualified health plans and ASO contracts, so that um, I feel is imminent. In terms of Medicare and Medicaid, as the folks on this call know, really the negotiation on the Medicare contract is between the state signers and CMMI, of course, um, with discussion and input in terms of um, what the ACO participants can bear. And the desire overall with Medicaid is to be able to align where possible and if all possible with the Medicare program so that we have a common um, understanding measures risks um, across all of our programs. So um, this year has been a fairly extraordinary year from the first time that we presented this budget to you. I believe it was October, close to my favorite holiday, Halloween. And at that time, we had set forth a population health plan and budget. As um, the year started to materialize, we saw the need because of COVID to reduce hospital dues. Uh, dramatically and recall that hospital dues are both the operational costs here at OneCare, so for the data, the people, the regulatory oversight, as well as funding for the population health programs that support primary care, the home health designated agencies, and other community providers. We also saw um, a reduction in the amount of revenue coming in that was projected for the delivery system reform. Uh, that was cut essentially in half from what we had anticipated. So we needed to make some adjustments in terms of our overall population health plan. In doing so, we felt like we needed some guiding principles to move through that process with our board and our stakeholders. Our first principle was to sustain the existing One Care programs because those were programs that were in our contract. Our providers were uh, depending on that financial cash flow, and um, these are programs that are more core to our overall mission, vision, and value, and 
felt like we needed to keep those going for this year, programs such as the care coordination or our comprehensive primary care pilot for our independent physicians. We also wanted to, um, you know, continue that support and financial flow moving to our network. We also needed to take a good look at what um, new initiatives we were looking to stand up and whether or not we had the operational capacity to do so. So really looking at the resource demands that would take uh, standing up some of the programs that we were considering this year. And again, you'll see later on in the slide that we've had some pretty um, large reductions in overall workforce, pay freezes, um, pay reductions, benefit reductions within one care, much like the rest of the healthcare system. And at the same time, we really felt like it was our duty to make those reductions to support our network of providers. We also wanted to look to prioritize those initiatives that we really felt were clinically beneficial for our populations and our communities. So this is a grid of um, all of the population health programs that we had proposed in our original budget with Green Mountain Care Board. I thought it would be helpful to re really just look at what were the programs we decided um, using those principles that we were not going to implement in this, this, this fiscal year, which were the programs that had some revisions to them, either to the positive um, or perhaps um, to the negative, and then what were some of those programs that remained unchanged from when we originally testified. In terms of not implemented, uh, we were looking at rolling out a pharmacy program to really look at medical management and support of our overall care coordination model. That program was not uh, implemented, and the reason for that was based on the operational expense reduction. So that was one of our DSR investments that we had worked with the state on, and when um, the full uh, dollars were not realized, we had a discussion with the state and made some decisions on which programs to move forward with and which ones to not implement. We were also set, um, same with the DSR, to do some work on zero suicide and mental health, not begin that work. The 2020 innovation, the hospital do support uh, innovation. Uh, I think it was $750,000 we had projected for 2020. And in order to offset and reduce those dues, uh, we removed that from our budget for the year. In terms of revisions, RISE Vermont was slated to expand, and again, in order to provide some relief to hospital dues systems because of the reductions um, in the revenue coming in from the DSR, we did not roll that out fully. Um, we kept it at the current scale right now. And also many of the individuals working uh, within the RISE Vermont program and out of the community were redeployed during the public health emergency. We have our DOLSE program, which is um, working with the pediatricians and the parent-child centers. We had hoped to expand that this, this year, and we were not able to do so. Other revisions that were specific to COVID and not because of operational expense reductions was the uh, innovation fund. So many of our programs that were receiving funding for the innovations decided that they needed to hit um, a pause button during the COVID surge ramp up period. And so we allowed them to do that without any sort of financial repercussions and be able to start back up once they were in better recovery mode. For the comprehensive um, payment reform program, there were certain um, quality collection metrics that were required and reporting metrics that were required as part of that program that we eliminated in order to provide relief to the primary care offices. 
the value-based incentive fund, which is the fund that rewards quality. As you know, we worked with the Green Mountain Care Board um, to be able to uh, reduce the amount of funding, the additional funding that was being put away for the Medicare-specific program that was on top of the Medicare requirement. We also put in some provisions internally to be able to distribute that funding out or, um, prior to quality collections as long as we were successful with the payers um, and having that, that funding be tied to reporting and not to quality. In terms of the care coordination model, we did a few things with that that were COVID related. One, we did not implement the payment changes, which would result in paying only for engagement versus paying for um, kind of building the infrastructure around that program. For the, so we've hit the pause on that again for the first six. That will um, that payment change will start back up again in July. We also provided some additional um, funding for the care coordination model for the whole network in order to provide some cash flow to them. And that will be reconciled as, as things start to stabilize. The programs in our budget that remain unchanged are the Blueprint and SASH funding, and that's for the Medicare portion of the funding. The longitudinal care pilot, which is working with the VNA sites, we had some funding put aside for the designated agencies to pilot in sites having a um, clinician engaged for care coordination of people hitting the emergency room. And new for this year was we had an additional $100 PM per member per year uh, fee structure for um, primary care who were able to engage both Medicaid and Blue Cross mm -hmm. uh, individuals who previously had not seen a primary care physician mm -hmm. or PA. In terms of the reductions in hospital dues for this year, as I said earlier, really our mission remains the same but we needed to evolve our 2020 strategy in order to provide some financial relief to the hospitals that are bearing um, a large part of this population health reform efforts. So we were able to reduce dues by approximately $6 million for this calendar year. When we looked to see if there were any further reductions in population health, there really weren't any that we could see for this current calendar year that wouldn't um, hurt our provider system and the cash flow that um, they were dependent on. And so the, the reductions and the changes that you've seen in population health management are the only ones that we're planning on implementing for this current calendar year. Um, we'll provide you some additional detail, but we were able to realize about $3.2 million from operational cost savings. The bulk of that, probably 90%, was a result of hiring freezes. We had um, reductions in all of our leaders' salaries and benefits uh, for the calendar year and for a period of time. There was even reduction in their salaries and benefits. And because of the changes that Medicare was making with the other next-gen programs that they announced, I think a few weeks ago, saying that they would essentially reduce the ACO's overall risk um, for every month that the public health emergency was in effect, we um, were confident uh, that that would to apply to Vermont, although we had not um, seen anything official about that. And we had to make a decision on a reinsurance policy for the Medicare program. And so we made the decision with our board not to purchase that reinsurance policy for the year, which is a significant cost to the ACO. And with that, I cannot see my colleague Tom, and I hope he can see the screen. I'm going to turn it over to him. And then I assume 
Chair Mullen, that we'll take questions at the end, or did you want me to pause for questions now? Uh, we'll take questions at the end, and just to prepare the board members, I'm going to call on you in alphabetical order for your questions. All right. Uh, this is Tom speaking. Quick audio check. Can you hear me well? Yes. Very well. Great. Hi, everyone. So I'm going to add some numbers to everything that Vicki just spoke about and walk you first through really a summarized budget P&L. This is uh, similar to what you have seen in the past, but really just highlighting some of the high points or the major changes that occurred between the initial budget submission last uh, fall, winter, and this revised budget that we prepared for you today. So starting on the top row, the total cost of care targets has been reduced by $157 million. And that feels like a big number, but it's driven by um, almost exclusively the Blue Cross Blue Shield primary program. That is the large group and self-funded program. Two health plans, large health plans, decided not to participate in Vermont's healthcare reform efforts in 2020. Uh, we hope to have them in 2021, but the total cost of care for those two health plans has been removed from this uh, presentation here because we're not account accountable for that cost. So that represented nearly $150 million of the, the change between the two budget versions. The other programs, um, some went up, some went down, but it was largely due to ordinary attribution updates and finalization of benchmarks. Uh, more detail was supplied in the budget report that we submitted earlier this week. Moving down, we have the DSR funding row. Uh, this has been spoken about uh, quite a bit, and Vicki mentioned it earlier that we anticipated $7.8 million of revenue from this line, and that was cut in half to 3.9, so we've built that into the budget accordingly. And then really the important row, um, I think for this point in time, is the hospital dues number able to reduce uh, the dues by $6.2 million. We started with a model uh, having a little over $24 million of dues, and it's now uh, just over $18 million. For context, in 2019, total dues were in the $28 million ballpark, so we've been able to reduce by $10 million um, since 2019, which is very important progress for the sustainability of this model. As we move down into the expense section, uh, speak a little bit about the value-based incentive fund. We were able to reduce that program cost by $2.7 million. A couple moving parts in there, but the most material one is a modification to the Medicare um, mechanics, essentially, of how the value-based incentive fund dollars are accumulated. And with permission from the Green Mountain Care Board, we, will, we were able to waive the requirement to pre-fund 0.5% of the Medicare fixed payment, uh, which helps to significantly alleviate hospital dues. It's important to also note that there still is a quality component to that program. It's now exclusively handled at settlement. So it moves to the end of the year and thus alleviates the financial burden on the hospitals during, during the year. Next, we have a significant reduction to the specialist and innovation fund programs. If you recall the slide earlier in the presentation that had those guiding principles, many of the initiatives within uh, met those, those general criteria. They were either expansion of, of programs, existing programs that hadn't yet occurred, or new program initiatives that um, you know, had costs associated with them or, or perhaps uh, intensive um, resource demands on One Care Vermont. So we were able to reduce $3 million of expense in this area, essentially without pulling out the financial rug from participants in the network. And it was really important in any of these program changes that we didn't take existing funding streams that the network was relying upon and abruptly halt those fundings, those dollars. Uh, that would have been just very disruptive to an already financially strained healthcare system. Moving down into the infrastructure section, the first row is general operations. This is really the One Care Vermont floor uh, here in Colchester. $3.2 million of savings. That is driven uh, largely by um, human resource modifications. We have implemented a hiring freeze. Leadership has taken compensation reductions, like many of our participant hospitals, 
And we've also updated some operating expenses, such as mileage. Naturally, there's just not a lot of travel going on right now. Um, maybe expenses that would have happened from meetings, catering, food, things like that. Really gone through all the operating expenses and thinned out um, as much as we possibly could. Next, we have the risk protection. This is the reinsurance type arrangement. This was an interesting conversation. We had a number of discussions at Finance Committee and the board, but ultimately the decision was made to forego purchasing a policy in 2020. Um, the interesting components of this conversation are that there's a lot of uncertainty, and ordinarily that is a good, a good time to have a reinsurance type policy, but it also makes crafting an arrangement very difficult. When we don't have clarity about the true downside risk exposure that we're going to have come settlement, it is hard to really price a policy or set terms. In addition, it's um, looking like we're going to have an adjustment to our benchmark. That's um, We don't have any insight into that at this point in time. That also makes it very difficult to place a policy. So because of some of the complexities, also the general sentiment that the total cost of care has been low for a number of months, the decision was made to forego that policy. The savings there help us to offset hospital dues. And we can go to the next slide. I think you went backwards one, Vicki, just go down two. There you go. Thank you. All right, so just to put some numbers in play here, the, the budget process really had to balance the need for this dues reduction for the hospitals with the consistent funding to the provider community. So we're always measuring those two different components. And in the end, we were able to deliver the dues relief that we mentioned previously, but also sustain $20 million of plan investment in primary care, $60 million of plan investments in community providers. It's the mental health community, home health, et cetera. Along the way, we were able to advance $2.1 million to network providers, really in that heavy stay home, stay safe period where fee-for-service revenues would have been at their lowest. All of, all of those components are really important to ensure that the we're, we're doing our part to help take care of the participating providers and, and to the extent possible, keep cash flow um, ongoing. Next, we have the fixed payments. So really, to Vicki's point at the beginning, fee-for-service um, is very problematic when you have this type of a, a pandemic and volumes decline so rapidly. We were able to sustain the hospital fixed payments at the pre-COVID levels through June, um, and this was discussed with the finance committee and our participants around the right strategy, but it was decided that it was it was the right approach to sustain the funding at this um, pre-COVID level. And meanwhile, we saw very significant reductions in fee-for-service equivalent. When we did some some math on this, um, $38 million of sustained funding from the fixed payment model. And this really is evidence of, of really why a fixed payment approach rather than a volume-based approach is much more stable for the provider community. And um, it honestly feels good to be able to keep this kind of funding flowing to our participants in times where volumes and fee-for-service revenues would have otherwise been um, plummeting. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Vicki. Thank you, Tom. So I think this all sums up that uh, there were challenges present previously to healthcare reform efforts, and now we have some new ones um, to the soup, I guess. Uh, the system right now is fairly fragile, so we're looking to really laser focus on our efforts on what are the investments that we need to be making as a system of care to really promote health. We want to make sure that any um, individuals or populations that have stayed home um, in delayed care have the opportunity to be able to receive that care and do not continue to decline in their overall health. Really looking at ways um, because hospitals aren't able to invest in the population health efforts alone um, as they were 
pre-pandemic. So looking at some ways to share some broader accountability across the state as well as um, opportunities for additional revenue sources that, that might be available to us. In the next um, year and a half, I think we'll be in a period of rebuilding and the amount of risk exposure that is currently being taken on by the accountable care organizations and its providers is too high. Uh, so we really need a, I'll call it a glide path for the next year to uh, get agreement from the payers to be able to reduce that overall financial risk and exposure until that stabilization occurs. I said in previous testimonies that, you know, we probably need to start looking at what are the metrics of success during this pandemic in terms of our overall care evaluation and budgeting for this type of model in the future. And all this is to say that if there wasn't a, a dire need for reform before, there is now, and we really need to start working together as a system. We need to think of ways to really leverage um, the all-payer model ACO agreement that we have to move this forward to provide that, that sustainability and predictability that the healthcare system and Vermonters just, they, they need that um, sustainability and predictability. I think one of the biggest challenges that we're up against right now is timing and regulatory pressures. The hospitals need to submit a budget coming up in July. We are required to think about what our programs of events will look like for next year, what our overall risk corridors are going to be with the payers, and we're still in the process of renegotiating 2020. So there's a lot of uncertainty right now um, in a period of great uncertainty, which makes this a challenge for all of us. And I think we need to think creatively and look at opportunities to really provide relief um, where we can as we move forward. And I, I think I just said this last slide, we, we have an amazing opportunity with the LPAIR ACO model. And um, we should really be thinking and looking as a system of care how we can capitalize on that in order to drive the reform efforts forward. There's many levers that are left um, that we could be looking at, and I think that we should be talking collectively as stakeholders to see are there opportunities that we have missed because transitioning to this value-based system is really an investment in our future and one that we, we can't forego. And with that, I'll leave you with Seema Verma's quote, really, no, now more than ever, it's clear that our fee-for-service system is insufficient for the most vulnerable Americans because it limits payment to what goes on inside a doctor's office. The transition to a value-based system has never been so urgent, and I couldn't agree with those, those statements um, more. So with that, this is our question and answer slide, so I will open it up to the board for questions of Tom and I, and I can see Tom right now, so um, I think we'll be able to uh, go back and forth and decide who's it. It's always good to finish with a quote from Lou Holtz. <laughs> so with that, um, I'm going to start with Member Holmes. Okay, great. Um, thank you. And um, thank you also for the materials that you sent. I'm, I'm looking forward to digging through them a bit more and um, continuing the conversation with our staff analysis in a few weeks. But I do have a couple of questions at the moment. Um, so one of the things that strikes me is, you know, we, scale is really key to healthcare reform. So can you talk a little bit about the Blue Cross Blue Shield primary health plan opt-outs that you mentioned that were reducing the, um, the revenue? Uh, so remember for the a ASO program that each um, self-insured and group um, was able to opt in or opt out um, from the particular program. We did receive um, opt-outs from two, we not personally, Blue Cross Blue Shield received opt-outs opt from both the teachers union um, and the state employees. Okay. And okay. Just, yeah. That makes sense. I wasn't sure if that was who you were referring to. So perfect. Thank you. Expected. Um, 
Given the financial health of the hospitals, uh, have you made any adjustments to the risk model? And, and what are the financial criteria that you're using to assess current ability of hospitals to take risk? What metrics are you looking at if you've made any adjustments? We haven't made any adjustments yet, and then I'll let Tom take over because we're still trying to negotiate adjustments um, with the payers, and those have not been resolved yet. The payers haven't agreed. We did go out and survey all of our CFOs, CEOs. We looked at overall balance sheets. We worked with VAS. We came up with a risk corridor that we felt was achievable for the ACO and its financial participants, but we're still in a bit of a waiting pattern on that. Um, do you want to add more to that? Yeah, I'll, I'll say we we were hosting a series of finance retreats early in this calendar year to start discussing potential modifications to the risk model as we mature and evolve as an, as an ACO. Um, then the, then the virus hit, which honestly stalled this work a little bit as we shifted focus to making sure that our upstream payer contracts had as low risk as we could possibly get them. While there's still work to be done on what the ultimate risk model looks like, I think there's a couple of themes that are important to note. One, um, there seems to be general agreement we need to broaden the financial accountability across the network. And then the second one is there still is um, a lot of interest in the HSA specific accountability model, and we need to continue evaluating that. And, and if the hospital is the really the primary risk bearer, um, is still right. So there, there's work to be done, um, but I, I do think that the virus has shifted our focus more to the upstream risk rather than how we delegate it within the network. Okay. Um, and actually, when we think about COVID, obviously there's been, as you mentioned, both mentioned, there's been an increased appetite and appreciation for fixed payments. So I'm wondering if there's been interest from providers for expansion or participation in the CPR pilot program. We, we haven't really queried the network yet. We're getting into that um, recruitment phase now. And I would... Uh, I would think there will be added interest, but I have not specifically heard from anybody yet. Um, I, th I think the model adds an element of stability that um, now more than ever is evident as a real benefit. Okay. Um, and I guess my last kind of question is around the variations in care analysis that um, you do, thinking about it in the current climate of COVID and with you know, some reductions in population health investments that are now going forward. Population health investments for one way, the ACA is going to, you know, a view through which it was going to address cost and quality differences across HSAs. So I'm wondering where you are at with that um, analysis that you do and, and policies that you might implement as a result or investments you might implement as a result of differences, differences in cost and quality across HSAs. I think one of the challenges um, is that uh, the, the payer data this year uh, has not been as uh, reliable or uh, readily available to us, and so that type of analysis has not been completed. Okay. And I, obviously, I know that we're obviously in a different world of care anyway, um, but I, I was just curious, given the, the reduction in population health investments, if you're the analysis or the methodology was going to change in any way. Um, but got it. I think that's it for me. I have, there's a lot to dig into and think about, and I know we're going to be talking about this in the next few weeks, and I look forward to the staff analysis and digging through some of the materials you all submitted in the past few days. So thank you. Thank you, Jess. Next is member lunch. Robin? Hi. Thank you. Hi, Vicki. Hi, Tom. Thanks for your slides and information. Um, I actually wanted to start with um, a submission that you made earlier, uh, but didn't touch on in your slides, which is the 2021 Network Development Strategy document that was submitted in April. Um, I was curious to know how COVID um, might impact that development strategy and that timeline. So I. Robin, this is um, 
Vicki, um, as part of this, we've had some discussions with the payers. We've pro been provided with some relief um, from Medicare in terms of submitting its roster list until the end of September. We're working with the other payers in the same vein. It's very difficult for us to be able to um, send out a contract for 2021 when we're not clear on what the terms will be yet, um, what the program of payments will be. And so I think we're going to see that that time frame uh, gets delayed. And in terms of provider participation, I think for this year there's a lot of uncertainty right now and a lot of financial pressures that will go into this. So, um, our overall um, goal is to at least preserve the network that we have in place, um, but an expansion at this point in time, I would say, is highly unlikely, unless there's some significant changes made to the model. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, it sounded, I was interested in a little bit more information on the Blue Cross Blue Shield fixed payment pilot in Bennington um, uh, in terms of how it's rolling out and um, just a little more qualitative description of how that's going and whether you would expect um, that model to grow to other communities next year. Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, so we started started this uh, pilot in April, so we only have a couple of months of experience. But everything I've heard from um, Southwestern Vermont Medical Center is uh, very positive. I believe that they're correctly processing claims, um, which is an area that we've had problems with other payers. Um, sure. So just to make sure that that's working appropriately is, is encouraging. Um, I think we're going to, I think the word coming from Southwestern is going to be really important to help convince others that this is working effectively and is a, a viable option for next year. The other component is um, we would much prefer to have an unreconciled fixed payment model. And while we test this out, we are reconciling it. I think that's appropriate as we ease into the, to the, the concept here with Blue Cross. But if we can deliver and, and work out the right way to do it with Blue Cross, um, an unreconciled fixed payment, I think the appetite for this, this type of rollout will grow. So encouraged by the early results, but there's a, a few other steps that I think we need to evaluate and just take a little bit more time before we really aggressively push it out to a broader um, list of participants. Great. Well, uh, thank you for that update. I, I knew it had been implemented fairly recently, so um, it's just good to hear how things are going. Um, sorry, I'm just going through my notes here to see where my next question was. Um, in terms of, um, so Vicki, you touched on this, in terms of the complex care model changes that you're, you are intending to implement, you did indicate that they would start in July. I think your report was shooting for July 1st, but how do you, do you think that that's more realistically going to be later in July or how is that going? Uh, we are planning on rolling that out for July 1st. Okay, great. Um, on Dulce, in your, in the report that you provided, um, you mentioned that m many of the, the pediatric practices primary care practices had um, moved to some telemedicine visits for this program, and I was wondering if you have any feedback on how that worked. I do not personally have that feedback, but I can certainly talk to the folks um, within OneCare that run that program and be able to get back to you with that information. Great. Um, I think... That, those are my questions. Let me just check one more page of notes. Yep, no, that's it. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Robin. Member Pelham, Tom. Hello, Vicki and Tom. Um, hope you uh, survived these last, uh, what, six or seven record days of eat. Um, Kevin so Melton, yeah. Say it again. 
We haven't melted yet. <laughs> oh. <laughs> I have, I tell you. Um, so my first question has to do just with aligning uh, these attribution numbers a bit. Um, I, you know, this is the report from Joan Zipko where there's a sentence that says, in total, 2020 represented another year of significant attribution growth. But the table just gives the 2020 profile. So in terms of, of comparing it to, you know, where we've been uh, previously, uh, that data is not there. But then I would uh, kind of point to another document that's in process at the Green Mountain Care Board, which is the draft annual scale targets in the annual report for 2019. And that does include a chart that profiles attribu attribution growth from uh, 2017 through projected 2020. Although that 2020 was based on the, on the budget that you submitted previously, not these updated numbers. So, uh, my suggestion is that, uh, uh, if I would think that these uh, two reports uh, should align with each other, and uh, it might be that Elena and Michelle and you folks have to spend a little time making sure that um, you know things are are, are coordinated. Um, I will note in um, <clears throat> Joan Zipko's report on page, uh, it's page five. Um, <clears throat> she says One Care has received an additional twenty-eight thousand. 515 lives through the expanded attribution for Medicaid in 2020, yet in the chart under Medicaid expanded, it's a 21,178. So I'm just wondering whether I'm missing something or is that a typo or or what, what might explain that difference? Yeah, I can explain that. So we get initial attribution prospectively before the plan year even begins. So sometime in October, we'll get, for example, for a Medicaid program at least, uh, an initial attribution run. Same, The same dynamic happens for Medicare as well. A number of lives drop out before the program even begins. So typically when it comes to budget work, we use the actual number of lives that cross into that January 1st threshold actually into the performance year. How the scale target lives uh, component works may be different. I'm not sure exactly how the Green Mountain Care Board treats that uh, particular nuance, but that would be the reasoning behind what really I'm using in the budget to calculate estimated total cost of care, estimated PHM revenue or receipts, things like that, versus the scale attribution, which may be different. Okay, thank you for that. Um... I, I would just again suggest that uh, our folks um, make sure that all of this is aligned so that we're not looking at different documents that say different things. Uh, and it might be definitional or it might just be you know, two people working, two entities working uh, collaboratively but in separate space. Um, I'm looking at uh, the discussion again in Joan Zipko's uh, memo about complex care and uh, it would seem to me, and certainly that this pandemic was a, uh, a huge um, um, test for um, <clears throat> the complex care system uh, that wasn't expected, but I heard from a number of people that um, it was our complex care system was very helpful. And so I'm just wondering to give some detail to uh, you know, the conversation that, that the system was very helpful during the pandemic. Uh, do you have any insight into those that are in the risk categories three, which are a full onsla onslaught of a chronic disease, and category four, complex and catastrophic of, of patients? Do, do, you, do you have any uh, numeric or documented, uh, um, you know, profile of of how that system responds uh, responded during this pandemic. We are um, in the process um, of gathering that data. We do um, keep track uh, monthly the information in terms of how many people are under care management, what kind of level of care management they fall into, but in 
terms of evaluating just that specific cohort, we don't have the data yet to be able to do the evaluation on that specific cohort. We do have evaluation on individuals who have consistently been in the complex care coordination program, I think over the last 18 months, where we can show, um, you know, the overall outcomes and results of those populations that have been um, undergoing care management services. Thank you. Um, my next question has to do with the uh, distribution of uh, hospital dues and, and the reduction that, there. And, you know, as you noted, it's a little over $6 million, um, and which is 25.5% of what was originally budgeted. And, uh, but if you look at some of these percentages different, percentage different by hospitals, uh, there's, there's quite a spread. Um, you know, there's as low for Southern Vermont. A medical center at 20% and as high as uh, uh, from out of Scutney of 47%. And um, I've, I'm just wondering, was there any noise around this reduction process, or uh, is it that um, you know the logic behind e each hospital's reduction is a logic that the hospitals accept and understand? Yeah, that's a great question. The when we make the budget changes, it, it updates the aggregate dues number. So it moved from 24.4 down to 18.2. There is a logic that de defines the way in which the 18.2 is divvied up and allocated to each of the participating hospitals. That policy goes through finance committee and the board every year for review and update and involves a couple of different components. There's some financial relief for critical access hospitals, and also the amount of PHM dollars coming back to the hospital is a factor. So a, a hospital that employs a lot of primary care will be subject to a different type of dues structure than a hospital that has no employed primary care. And, and that was decided really for, for some equity purposes back in 2017. And um, every year we talk about this and, and evaluate further. And at this point in time, no significant changes have been made to that dues logic. Thank you for that. Um, let's see, two more quick questions. Uh, uh, I took a very quick look uh, a while back at the DIVA contract uh, with you folks and, uh, for 2019, and it was 130 pages long, which I thought, oh, my God, wow. Um, but when I got into it, I found that pages and pages and pages and pages of it had to do with the elimination of um, – uh, or the waiver of prior approvals for certain um, procedure codes. And I, I didn't take a look at the 2020 draft, but I guess that's in, in Exhibit 1. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about what, what uh, quantitative benefit you, you might uh, be aware of in terms of the elimination uh, of prior approval for those hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of codes? Uh, in the Medicaid contract. This is Vicki. I would say from the provider's perspective, if you look at like UVM alone, I think I heard a statistic the other day that prior authorization has about 44, over 40 FTEs associated with it. So anytime you can reduce prior authorization, you can redeploy people to uh, direct patient care to care delivery, not having to have that administrative um, burden of calling and, you know, asking for that prior authorization and providing that uh, clinical documentation for the insurance to be able to look at. It really, again, back to the ACO model, it really puts the clinical and financial accountability in the hands of the providers. So that would logically, I think, be savings for both the provider and the payer, both ends of that transaction. Yes, and we, yes, um, and we also, um, to make sure that there aren't any dramatic changes in any of the particular codes that previously require prior authorization, we track that uh, on, a, I believe it's a monthly basis to be able to review any sort of trends um, and that are statistically significant in terms of over or under utilization of certain codes because both are important um, factors of quality. 
Um, thank you for that. And my final question has to do with um, the budget for specialist program, innovation, the innovation fund, and the BBIF quality initiatives. And so is it right for me to understand that those associated numbers in the 2020 Green Mountain Territory number two, those are carry forwards from a prior year? There, there is some of that. Yes, you are correct. So there were a number of specialist fund programs where we committed to funding an initiative that had multiple years. Uh, one example was a, a chronic kidney disease initiative. So some of the funding that remains or expense rather that remains uh, is reflective of those prior commitments that were made. So again, go back to those principles. We didn't want to pull the rug out from the existing or committed funding streams to the extent that we could. Okay. So what, what I'm responding to is, again, in uh, Joan Zipko's uh, memo, and I'm quoting here, note that the Specialist Program Innovation Fund and VBIF quality initiative line items are funded using hospital dollars obligated in a prior year. So, um, so basically it is being sustained on carry-forward funds. That is true. And the other revenue line on the screen you can see uh, up right now, one of the one of the other revenue streams is a deferred dues fund. And whenever we we've generated those dollars to be used for these multi-year innovation or specialty fund programs, and then as the expenses uh, are incurred, we recognize those uh, deferred funds. Yeah. Well, thank you both for uh, for what you do and and your efforts over this unusual period of time. I'm sure it's it's been daunting at times, and uh, but you're still standing. And congratulations for that. Thank you. Thanks. 102 days and counting, or <laughs> something like that. <laughs> That's it. Thank you, Tom. Now we'll turn to Member Yusufer Maureen. Uh, sure. Hi, Vicki and Tom, and thank you for this presentation. Um, several of my questions have already been asked, but uh, just to touch on a couple things. One, um, this is a good page to have up. Um, on the general operations where you've seen the $3.3 million in savings from 20 um, from your original budget, and I understand some of that is um, – Compensation changes that that maybe the, you know people have taken, but beyond those, are there learnings or savings that could carry forward as you go into 2021 as well? I mean, have you gotten any efficiencies or or things like that 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 may be able to move forward into future years? That's a that's a really good question. I think we're probably still in the evaluation phase of that as we start to really flush out the 2021 budget model. But I don't know, not, probably similar to many other uh, businesses, we're evaluating our effectiveness in this remote space and how may, might we be able to use that to our advantage in the future. That being said, um, you know, a lot of the savings comes from activities where we'd be sitting face to face with our network. And that to me remains pretty important. Uh, we need to be communicating and, and having, you know, these complicated discussions with our network participants and some of the savings that we've built into this revised budget. I would, you know, advocate that we actually do want to get back out on the road a little bit more and see our, our participants face to face. So I, it's a really good question. I think it's something that we need to continue to evaluate, but I'm not sure we have um you know, fully fleshed out how we can take this circumstance and our learnings to date and really recast them into a 2021 budget. But I do think there's some possibilities. Okay. No, I definitely think it's something to look for. And I think, you know, many businesses will be assessing the same similar thing. So, you know, what did we sacrifice and what could we potentially do we maybe not not need as much for. So, you know, obviously we're pretty focused on the administrative side. So I think it would be good to look at that moving forward. Um, the next question I have is on the reinsurance or the risk protection. And you talked a little bit about it, but just to dig a little bit deeper on when you made that decision, um, you know, when typically 
can, you know, how late in the year can you make that decision? I guess because obviously, uh, um, you know, you think you would need to sign it up relatively early in the year, um, and then you know the potential risk that you have since you no longer have that risk protection. And I think you typically looked at using it for Medicare, which was the, the largest, um, you know, revenue category and, and the largest area of risk. So just and, and also then fast forwarding that to 21, you know, you know, how, how do you weigh that and decide whether you would be paying for the risk protection again? Yeah, good questions there. So typically, we would, I mean, we started the conversations with the, with our counterparty very early in the year and then, uh, it just got extended and extended as the, the virus hit and there became more and more unknowns. You know, you prefer to have something locked in earlier in the year. It's a little bit more fair to both parties because every passing month we get a new data file and that adds information to the picture that could be favorable or unfavorable and it's, it starts to make the negotiation a little bit, um, Awkward, I'll say. Uh, you know, in terms of like the actual time you have to have something locked in, this is a custom arrangement. There's, you know, you have your traditional insurance for your house, your car. Those are pretty standard, but there's a whole market of these, I'll call them exotic insurance protections, and you can negotiate whatever you want with them. You just have to have a counterparty to take, accept the deal. So there's no set in stone. Um, end date for it, but it was getting to the point where there were more and more questions rather than more and more answers as we got deeper into the year. What's our ultimate risk going to be? What's the final benchmark going to be? We don't know that right now based on this anticipated retrospective regional adjustment. So it makes it just very difficult to craft a policy and and then enforce it at the year, end of the year. If there's a lot of numbers that changed and you wrote the policy in a certain way, I could just see dispute coming up where you, you know, we agreed to this and it ended up not being this. How do you resolve that? So we just last month or this month rather at this month's um, finance committee and board cycle um, made this decision. The board made this decision. So it, it just happened now. Um, it was discussed at prior month finance committees as well. So it wasn't sprung on them in one, in one decision or, or vote. Um, I've also been in contact with the other party who I would like to work with in the future. I found them to be pretty agreeable. And we're both committed to, you know, reengaging in the conversation next year. That was one of my goals to make sure that we didn't um, throw out the baby with the bathwater on this one, because I think there's a lot of question marks about next year, too. And it might be appropriate to have a similar uh, protection in place for 2021. And could you go beyond Medicare if you wanted to? And we we could, we could. Um, Medicare has been the big risk number, but um, it might be appropriate to start thinking about whether or not um, some others come into. You know, we want to have a protection for another program as well. Yeah, I just think you know maybe in order to get all the hospitals able to participate and minimizing the risk to a degree, um, you know, should there be a huge, um, you know. Huge issue where we go, you know, go deep into the risk area. We would allow it to be a protection for many of the hospitals. But um, okay, those are the only questions I have. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Thank you, Maureen. At this time, I'm going to ask Elena if the staff has any questions. Um, we don't have questions at this time. We're going to wait for our uh, this week and then have um, our staff analysis in a couple weeks from now. Okay, great. So uh, at this point, I'll open it up to public comment. And if you could hit uh, star six to unmute yourself. Um, and go ahead, public comment. Uh, Chair Mullen, this is Susan. I just wanted to make sure there wasn't anyone else who joined after I um, read the numbers. I did hear Susan Aronoff's voice, and I did see her number. So I, I know she is an addition, but... I, I don't know if there was anyone else who joined after I read off the numbers. If you could announce yourself, that would be great. Okay. Susan, Hi. Mike Del Treco. Susan, Aaron. Oh, Mike no, Del Treco. Great. Yeah, I joined a little bit late. Thank you. 
Okay, thanks, Mike. And I heard someone else. Uh, Aaron Flynn from Diva. Aaron Great. Flynn from Diva. Great, welcome. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to open it up to public comment. Hello? Yes, go ahead. Hi, this is Walter. Uh, I wanted to look back at one of Tom's comments about the prior authorization. And as someone who nearly lost his life because of prior authorization, I'm curious why we need them at all. We have the power to stop them. We don't need them. Well, I'm not sure that we have the power. I think the legislature would have the power. Um, I don't know, Walter, if you recall that I had um, a bill back um, probably seven years ago now, maybe longer, that would have done away with prior OS. And at that time, the legislature bought into uh, just a pilot program. And um, yeah, I thought the pilot program, program went well, but nobody seems to uh, – be buying into it at uh, a meeting last year the board um, mm -hmm. especially member Holmes proposed a gold card program um, which I thought um, made a lot of sense because basically what it was saying was anybody that um, was using the, the proper prescribing methods would be given the gold card and um, wouldn't have to go through the prior authorization process and I thought that made a lot of sense because it not only um, rewarded the already good behavior of some, but it gave incentives for others to build up their uh, practices to the point where um, they achieve that gold status as well. Um, but Susan, do you know if uh, there's been any further discussion yeah. in the legislature this year? Yes, thank you, Chair Mullen. I wanted to add that Indeed, that gold carding language is in H965, which is with the Senate Health and Welfare currently. Um, it did pass out of the House. And there's also other prior authorization language um, built upon um, consensus work that payers and VMS, as well as um, others, um, came together to create. And um, the committee also took into consideration the work that you referenced, uh, Chair Mullen, regarding some of the board meetings we had a around the administrative burden of prior authorization. So that language is on the Senate Health and Welfare website, and I'd encourage you, Walter, to take a look at it. It's encouraging. It's not it's not 100 percent there, but it's a start. What's the bill number, Sue? H965. I'll send it to you. Oh, sweet. Thanks. Yeah, and Vicki, you may want to talk about some of the efforts in the model as far as prior auth. Are you talking to me? I'm sorry. Vicki. Oh, I didn't oh. hear. Yeah. I think um, we've been making great strides with Diva in terms of looking at um, turning off the prior authorization requirements um, for the ACO participants that are participating in the model uh, moving forward. And we have seen uh, really nice results with that in terms of, you know, pretty stable utilization of services and no quality uh, concerns from turning those off. Absolutely. And I just support that um, moving forward with other payers. So I'm happy to see that there's some legislative efforts. And I just want to um, correct the record. It's H960, uh, H965 is the CRF bill. But <laughs> I get, I keep getting them confused. Those pesky numbers. They it's are. Easy to do, I know. <laughs> okay, other members of the public. Yeah. Other members of the public.
Hi, this is Mort Wasserman. Thank you, Mort. I have uh, I served on the DIVA uh, Clinical Utilization Review Board for a number of years, and there was a an experiment with diagnostic radiology and gold cards, which, as I recall, worked out quite well. But there are different kinds of prior authorizations, and I'm not sure which ones are up for grabs. Some are for diagnostic testing, and that's one thing. Some are for pharmacy, and that's another thing. So I wonder which ones might be in that bill that Susan Barrett just mentioned. Are you there, Susan? Sorry, I was on mute. I was sending it out to um, I was sending the bill out to Walter. I will I will um I can get back to you, Dr. Wasserman. But I, I do believe that what you're referencing is exactly what um, Chair Mullen was referencing was the pilot project that we did several years ago. But I'll um, I'll send you a copy of the bill as well and I'll get back to you on what's in it. Great, because they're very different kinds of prior authorizations. And with the what pharmacy benefit managers do in moving around from uh, proprietary to generic meds for various conditions, it can be very confusing to a primary care physician who is used to prescribing the generic for a certain group of um, beneficiaries and then all of a sudden learns that uh, from a patient that they've showed up to pick up their generic and it costs them 70 bucks for the month. So uh, I think it, it's worth uh, discriminating between diagnostic testing and pharmacy benefits. That's all. Dr. Wasserman, um, just if I could just address that for a second, um, I just wanted to clarify for the record that our prior author exemption is not for pharmacy. Um, because we are, as an ACO, not a financial risk for the pharmacy benefit um, management that happens at a retail pharmacy. Um, we are responsible for any kind of medications that are essentially administered in the hospital or the physician office, though. Thanks. Okay, other public comment? Hearing none, I want to thank uh, Vicki and Tom for an excellent presentation. I'm sure that uh, we will be following up with some uh, questions and appreciate your time this afternoon. Also appreciate all the efforts that you've done to um, try to put some liquidity back to the, uh, the hospitals in the form of reduced dues because it has been, uh, you know, truly uh, an exceptional time period. And um one that I'm sure we'll never forget and hopefully we'll never have to live through again. Um, but thank you for all that you're doing. Um, with that, is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. It's been moved by Maureen and seconded by Tom to adjourn. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Thank you, everyone. Have a great rest of the day.